Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you may be around the world. Uh, thanks for joining in for my talk today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how to manage data consistency among microservices with the Bezium. Um, so the agenda for this talk uh, is going to be similar, a little bit similar to um, the following. We'll talk a little bit about what are microservices, how have microservices architecture really fundamentally changed how we design and architect our applications, uh, what are the challenges around how we currently manage data around um, our services while we've been trying to move to this new paradigm shift of using microservices as well as some of the solutions that uh, we've seen in the industry today and some trends moving forward, um, as well as propose a new paradigm of thinking with using change data capture uh, with the BZM2 solution for some of that. Um, and if time permits, hopefully we'll uh, be, able to be able to share a quick demo uh, with the BZM um, and kind of show you how it looks, uh, how does it work. Uh, and then finally, hopefully I'll leave some time at the end to be able to answer any questions that you may have. Um, so with that, uh, there should be a text box on your screen where you can enter any questions that you may have. So while I'm going through this presentation, please feel free to go ahead and uh, post any questions that you may have there. And at the end uh, of this presentation, uh, hopefully we'll have time to be able to go through and answer some of those. So uh, without further ado, before I continue the rest of my presentation, just a little bit about myself, a uh, quick introduction. My name is Justin Chow. I am a software slash DevOps engineer working at Optum, uh, which is a healthcare IT company under United Health Group. Um, this is my second time attending the Open Source Summit. Uh, my first time was last year in uh, San Diego, and I was just blown away by the open source community and everybody and all the interactions that I had there that I just had to come back again for a second time. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be invited back a second time as a speaker this year around. And so uh, very excited and honored to be here uh, speaking with you all. Um, I did graduate from the University of Texas at Austin, so I was very much looking forward to going back to my alma mater and hitting up all my favorite breakfast taco joints. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's gonna be able to happen, uh, which is probably a good thing seeing as Texas is quickly becoming the new epicenter in the United States for the coronavirus. Um, so I'm glad we're all still able to meet together virtually. Um, I think the Linux Foundation team and the platform team have done a tremendous and amazing job at uh, completely restructuring the way this conference is being done uh, to a virtual platform. So um, if you all haven't yet gone over on Slack and given them a quick thanks, um, please be sure to do that because they have worked tirelessly uh, to ensure that this conference goes off without a hitch. Um, so uh, real quickly, uh, I have my LinkedIn down there. If uh, any of y'all want to connect with me, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, so continuing on, a little bit about microservices, right? So I'm sure most, if not all of us have heard about microservices, uh, but just to make sure that we're all talking on the same page here for the rest of the presentation, I thought I'd go through and do a quick, you know, brief introduction on what they are and why they're so big in the industry today, right? So um, some five pros for why we're moving to microservices. Um, number one, you get improved fault isolation. Um, and so what that means is what we've done is we've broken down these large monolithic, ap monolithic applications into smart compartmentalized separated services. Um, so if any one of those microservices, for example, fails, we have some level of fault isolation where we don't lose the entire application, you know, the entire system doesn't go down. Um, and we could do so through the use of service meshes, through integrated cir circuit breakers across these distributed services, right? Things of that nature. Um, number two, we're able to eliminate vendor and technology lock-in across our services. And what are some of the advantages that that gives us? Um, well, number one, right? So now that you have these separated, isolated services that can be developed independently from each other, um, you can choose whatever technology stack you may want to use for your different services. So say you may have a Java service um, that you're trying to leverage the Spring Boot framework for, for a particular capability. 
um, versus you're trying to design another set of solutions that uh, you may want to use Scala or Python or what other languages that you might want or whatever technology stacks that you may want. You can do that uh, because you're able to separate these services out, develop them independently and deploy them independently with this kind of architecture, right? So um, thirdly, uh, this promotes ease of understanding. Um, and so what I mean by that is uh, when you've got these services that are separated from each other, you get smaller code bases, right? And um, smaller code bases are easier to understand if you're trying to onboard new developers to your team. Um, and along the same lines with that, with smaller code bases and less scope within those code bases, you get decreased dependencies and risks, which lead to smaller and faster and more iterative deployments, right? And so that's the idea that we get behind of CI, CD, and DevOps processes. Right? Um, and so those go hand in hand together very nicely. And finally, um, a fifth point I'd like to make is scalability. Uh, because you've got all these services that are separated from each other, you're able to now more easily scale out the services that you most need at the appropriate times, as opposed to trying to scale out the entire application as a whole, right? And this can lead to tremendous cost savings, right? Because now you can, if you've got monitoring and observability in place, right, identify where are the bottlenecks in your microservices architecture and um, selectively scale out those bottlenecks and those services at the right time, uh, rather than having to scale out the entire system as a whole. All right, so those are just some five um, pros for why we um, use microservices. Um, let's talk a little bit about how we've come to design these microservices architectures, right? So how do you know which services to separate from another service and develop them independently? Uh, well, largely in the industry today, we've seen the idea of using uh, the idea of domain-driven design. Um, and this is, I think, quite an old um, line of thinking, which might actually predate before uh, microservices architecture, but it's still very relevant today in how we design our applications. Um, and what domain-driven design basically means is we're modeling our uh, domains and our services around business use cases. So using um, independent problem areas, or as you'll often hear, these bounded contexts uh, around these business use cases to isolate and decide which services to separate from each other. So um, to, to make that into a little bit more of a concrete example, uh, what you would be doing is decomposing these large monolithic systems into separate distributed services that are built around these independent bounded context business domain capabilities. So say you have a um, business capability under domain A, for example, that you need to solution for, you would develop a specific service, we'll call it microservice A for that. Um, likewise, if you had another independent bounded context business use case, uh, we'll call it domain B, you would design um, a set of services or microservice B for that particular domain, and likewise for C and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and this way of thinking has really fundamentally changed how development teams form because now what we've seen in the world of moving to agile and um, scrum teams and um, things of that nature, we're forming these teams in a way where they can be independent of each other and each team autonomously owns a business domain capability. And that has really sped up the way we do application development because now each individual team is responsible for understanding a particular bounded context, an independent problem area of the business. They, that leads to better understanding of the business requirements, which then leads to better solutioning, uh, which then leads to faster development time. And you know you get the idea from there on there forth, right? So that has really fundamentally changed um, application development. Uh, next slide. But what about the data? Um, because while we've been moving to the idea of using microservices and um, developing these problem, uh, these solutions for these independent problems for our businesses and uh, autonomous teams, um, 
the data ends up looking a little bit like this, where we've got all these different microservices across different domains, uh, but they're using a shared database, right? And there, there are a couple of reasons for why, for how we've um, come to end up where we are right now, right? So traditionally, um, some arguments for using a single database include, well, it can be difficult to engineer uh, data backup and restore procedures if you've got multiple databases, right? So having a centralized location for your data, having a shared database um, uh, optimizes for that uh, problem. Number two, maybe you've got these uh, a team of DBAs who may be constrained resource-wise and uh, can only maintain um, a single database, and therefore you're constrained to using a shared database kind of architecture across all the services that you're trying to manage. Um, third, I, uh, a third um, uh, a third reason might be uh, data replication, right? So um, it's easier to be able to manage data replication and high availability of your data needs if you've got everything in a single shared database rather than having multiple different databases, right? Um, but what are the challenges that come with using the shared database kind of uh, architecture? Uh, so if you're a seasoned developer, some of these might resonate very much with you, but uh, development time coupling, right, to give you an example. And what I mean by development time coupling is uh, let's say, for example, a developer is working on a particular service, service A, uh, and some of the changes that need to be done for a feature that the developer A is working on requires some schema changes in the database. Uh, well, now he has to, or she has to, have uh, coordinate with developers in domain B and C, so microservices B and C, uh, for those schema changes. Um, and so that can cause a lot of um, dependency as well as it slows down development time because now you have to meet up with those developers and make sure that uh, any schema changes that you're making doesn't affect them or if it does affect other services, you have to make sure you coordinate changes with those other services before you release the service into production, right? And, and a lot of times in, the, in large enterprise corporations, if you're working on these large scaled agile release chain environments, for example, we may introduce uh, scrum ceremonies like a scrum scrums kind of meeting that uh, scrum masters from each team meet together once a week or so to discuss these dependencies, right? And uh, that has been a solution that we've seen in the industry today, but it still, the problem remains where we've got that dependency and risk that slows down development time uh, number two, we get runtime coupling. Um, and so what I mean by that is, let's say, for example, service A has a long running transaction that holds a lock on the database. Uh, well, then that prevents other transactions from other services from being able to, say, access that particular database at runtime. And so you get those dependencies and risks as well. Um, and finally, the idea of vendor or technology lock-in. And so similar to what I alluded to before with microservices, if you're using a single database design, one single database might not satisfy the data storage and access requirements of all the services or future services um, that you're trying to solution for. Uh, and so to give you an example, service A might benefit very greatly from a relational database management system like MySQL or so uh, to serve its data and provide a particular solution for that business capability, right? Um, but what if you're trying to develop a recommendation engine, right? And you're trying to develop a microservice B to be able to serve that capability. Uh, and you might want to use a graph database for that recommendation engine. Well, you can with a shared database design because um, if you're already using MySQL database for your shared database, you know, you're stuck with using MySQL as your shared database design. Likewise, if you're trying to use NoSQL for microservice C, or even if you're trying to build out, I'll give you another example, search capabilities, right? A lot of times um, the popular uh, tool of choice for building out search APIs and capabilities is using an elastic search or something along those lines, or a Lucene. Um, and if you've got a shared database design, well, again, you're stuck with the initial database that you chose. Uh, so what are some ways uh, that we've seen 
uh, developers kind of cope with this um, constraint, some of these constraints, right? So let me click on the next slide here. Well, one idea is to use service interfaces, right? Um, and this is nothing new. Uh, we've seen the idea of using service interfaces in service-oriented programming for a very, very long time now. Um, and the idea is to encapsulate the data access in a service interface. And what this enables you to do is it provides opportunities for reusability with other service modules that you may be building, um, which is great, right? But the challenge with using service interfaces is one, service interfaces inherently hide the data, right? And sometimes you don't want that. You wanna be able to have the freedom to slice and dice your data like any other data set. For example, if you were trying to use data for some sort of machine learning or AI, right? A data scientists like to be able to access that raw data to be able to manipulate it and massage it as they need to. Um, number two, scalability. Uh, service, interfaces, service interfaces aren't the most scalable um, because what ends up happening is as you're growing out your service interface and exposing an increasing set of functions, Sometimes it starts to look like its own homegrown database, right? And potentially becoming a monolithic service in and of itself. And it becomes very difficult to maintain and manage and develop on. Um, and data volume amplifies this service boundary problem even more because the more shared data is hidden inside that service boundary, the more complex the interface will become and the harder it will become to join data sets across your different services. Um, so can we do better, right? Are there other solutions that we've thought of? Um, so another idea is, well, why don't we apply the idea of having separate domains for our uh, services to the data as well? So have these, call them micro databases, if you will. Um, and then have this sort of architecture where uh, each domain holds its own data. Uh, and then each service is responsible for its own data, right? Uh, but the challenge here is more often than not, services aren't so isolated and independent from each other that you can have this kind of architecture without having, um, w without needing data from other domains, right? So what I mean by that, to put it in other words, is more often than not, a service in domain B will need data from another domain in order to fulfill you know, the solution that it needs to serve that capability. Um, so what ends up happening is you start doing these uh, ETL processes to extract and move whole data sets across your domains and across your services um, to be able to, you know, reuse and share data across domains as you need them. Uh, and what ends up happening is because different services make different interpretations of the data, uh, which means that they keep that data around and that data is altered and fixed locally pretty soon, that data doesn't represent the source data set much at all. And what we end up with at the end of the day is divergent data across our services. And divergent data is very difficult to fix in retrospect. And nobody likes bad data. Um, so can we do better? Uh, so if we take a step back and summarize a little bit of what we've talked about so far and what are the requirements that we're trying to solution for here. Um, they are, number one, we want some decentralized approach to how we are able to access and manage the data, much like how we are managing our uh, services today, right? Um, number two, we still want some degree of centralization so that we're able to maintain that golden record. Uh, so we're able to know what the source of truth is if we're trying to share data across our services, right? Um, and number three, uh, we want the ability to maintain data consistency across our distributed systems if we're trying to share data across our services. We don't want to be reliant on uh, large ETL batch processes that only happen every 24 hours or once a week um, and waiting on those to waiting on those pipelines to complete and finish before we're able to ensure we, we're using the right and the up -to -date, most up-to-date data for our different services, right? Uh, so, next slide. 
So I was reading a blog post earlier, uh, earlier in the year, maybe, I don't remember how long it was ago, but it was a post by Zamak Degani, uh, who at the time was a principal technology consultant at ThoughtWorks. Um, and she had proposed the idea of, okay, let's, let's apply the idea of domain-driven design and bounded contexts to the way we understand data ownership. Right, so having those micro databases that sit under each business domain capability, uh, but at the same time, uh, make the data for each of those domains available through a shared journal, a centralized journal, or um, a log, if you will, so that other services can access that shared data. Um, and so, what this means is now you've got this decentralized approach to how each service is able to manage its data locally and optimize uh, that data locally for its own use. So, so domain A can choose whatever sort of database it wants to use. Domain B can choose whatever database it wants to use and so forth so on, right? But you've also got this centralized log or journal where um, your different services can um, subscribe to, if you will, or consume from uh, for any data that other services might be trying to make available. Uh, and so what this means is um, more often than not, this kind of journal or this distributed log, um, we see implemented using Kafka as a streaming platform. Uh, and so what ends up happening is uh, you might have your services domain and domain A making their data available through streams to the log through a streaming platform like Kafka. Uh, and what this provides then is um, a way for us to be able to scale out the underlying uh, way of how we're able to access the data. Um, because Kafka is a pretty solid platform that's been tested many times over the years in production, uh, we know that it's scalable. Um, we, we can consume from it and produce to it with hundreds and thousands of different services. Uh, and it's also retentive and replayable um, because you not only got this uh, platform where you can subscribe to for data changes, but those data changes can be kept uh, in Kafka and can be replayed uh, from any point in time if you're trying to, say, create new services, right? And you want those new services to be able to access previous data. Um, and so what this introduces is this idea of stream processing uh, that looks a little bit like the next slide like this. Um, and so what, is actually, what does this actually look like, right? Does this mean that each service needs to publish data changes not only to its own database, but also to this centralized journal or log? Um, and does this, is this what it looks like where you have this idea of dual rights, where you have to not only write to your own database, but also write to this um, journal? Uh, or the centralized log. Um, well, if any of y'all have kind of worked with uh, database uh, designs uh, before, you know that dual rights are definitely not idea because what ends up happening is uh, if your first transaction to your database succeeds, but your second transaction to the uh, second data source, in this case, that distributed log, that streaming platform fails, well, now you're back uh, into the issue of having data inconsistency across your services, right? Which is what we're trying to solve and solution for in the first place. So we don't want to use dual rights. Um, not idea. Uh, can we do better? Right? Can we solution for this? Um, and this is where the Bezium fits in. So the Bezium uh, is a set of connectors that can be deployed via Kafka Connect APIs. And uh, where it sits is it, it, sits, uh, it, it helps interface between the database and Kafka or the distributed log. Right? Um, and so what this eliminates is the need for that dual write problem um, because now your services only have to concern themselves with writing those data changes to their own database. And then the BZM picks up on those data changes from those databases and propagates those changes down to that shared journal, to that distributed log, if you will. Uh, in this case, Kafka. Right? Uh, and the BZM does this uh, with very low delay, it also captures all data changes. So that includes any creates, any inserts, any updates, any deletes, 
Um, and it also requires no changes to your underlying data model. So great solution. A um, little bit deeper dive into its architecture though. How, how does this actually work? How does the BZM um, listen to and access those changes and knows when those changes come in from the database? Uh, well, the way the BZM works is it listens to, or it, it yeah, it listens to the um, log files, the transaction logs um, that get written to whenever there's a tra transaction that happens against that database. So in the example of MySQL, it'll listen to the bin log. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of what that looks like in a demo later. Uh, and then what happens is the BZM takes those changes and then propagates those, uh, it creates any uh, change event to a Kafka topic. And so now this change has been sent over to Kafka um, and it lives in a Kafka broker on a Kafka topic uh, that can then be consumed from um, consuming microservices um, or even other data sources as well. And so some of the connectors that the BZM currently have um, work with MongoDB, MySQL, PostgreSQL, uh, SQL Server, and there are three that are currently in an incubating status, I believe, uh, Oracle, DB2, and Cassandra. So uh, most of all the popular databases um, that we see um, everybody using today, the BZM supports. Um, so oh, next slide, there we go. So this is um, another architecture diagram that I just pulled off of the, the museum documentation. Um, it goes into a little bit more detail into what the museum actually does. So um, let's say you've got um, service A and service B. Service A is using MySQL, service B is using Postgres, um, and you want to be able to uh, capture any of those data changes uh, so that uh, you can propagate those changes or consume from them and other services to maintain data consistency in another service or even replicate that data for any other purpose, right? Um, so what happens is the BZM, um, you deploy it uh, as a separate component um, and then you have it listen to the transaction logs from your database. Um, and then as those change events come in, it will create a change event that gets uh, sent over to a Kafka topic, and by default, the BZM will create a separate topic within Kafka per database table. Um, you can, of course, change that with the multitude of different configuration options that um, you can provide the BZM with, but by default, that's what it does. Um, and then from there, uh, you can either consume it with a um, microservice that you may have yourself, like uh, shown in the previous diagram, or if you're familiar with Kafka, Kafka also provides a wealth of additional Kafka connectors, right? So you can be using these Kafka connectors as well to stream that data to downstream uh, data sources. So that may be Elasticsearch, it may be another MySQL database that another service may be using, it could be a data warehouse, you know, whatever you want. Right? Um, and so what does this change event actually look like? Uh, well, to provide you with another example, I, again, just took this off of the, the BZM documentation, but let's say we had a update statement that was made to a MySQL database. Um, so on the left-hand side of the slides, uh, let's say you had that update statement, right? We're updating customer where we want to update the first name of that customer. Uh, well, what then ends up happening is the BZM will uh, capture that and it will create, again, that change of it. Right, that gets propagated down into a Kafka topic. That change event looks like what you see on the right-hand side here, uh, where it will give you the schema. So not only would it capture any data changes, it will also capture any schema changes as well. Um, but then if you look in the payload section here, we've got a couple of interesting um, uh, points here. Right? So it gives us the before picture for what the data looked like before that change happened. Uh, it then gives us the after um, picture where it shows us now what does the data look like after that update command has been made. And finally, uh, thirdly, it gives us additional metadata regarding where that event happened. Did it happen in the MySQL database? Did it happen in the Postgres database? Um, and then fourthly, over here, you can just see the OP stands for operation, I believe, where the U stands for update. So this is an update operation. 
and then the timestamp at which the VZM captured that change event. Uh, so it gives you a wealth of information. Um, so you can use this now in any of your downstream services or consuming services um, that are subscribing to these change events to uh, propagate those data changes and update those uh, data that they may be needing locally for those services as well. So how, about, how are we doing on time? Yeah, I think we've got time for a quick demo. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so how does this all actually work in real life? So I'm gonna hope that demo works. Most of the time demos never work for me, but um, what we're gonna do here is I've got a Kubernetes cluster running on Azure. So it's just Azure Kubernetes service. Um, and if you look on the Like on the left-hand window here, you'll see I just ran a command to get pods. Uh, right now, I'm just running a single broker, capital broker, single node, um, and associated zookeeper. Just very simple, um, single Kafka cluster. Um, and what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to go ahead and create a MySQL database. Uh, so go ahead and navigate to my deployment manifest. So this is what it looks like, right? Pretty simple. If any of y'all have worked with Kubernetes manifests before, this should look relatively uh, familiar to you. I'm just pulling a very generic, basic MySQL image from Docker Hub. And I'm going to go ahead and apply this manifest so that it creates a MySQL database. And you should see on my terminal window here that my SQL database is coming up and it is now running. If we take a look at the logs. See it bootstrap itself and it is now ready for connections. Excellent. Okay, so if we exec into this pod real quick. and log into MySQL. See that it's, you know, a very uh, basic vanilla out of the box MySQL instance, only just deployed, there's no data in it at all, right? Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to go ahead and populate it with some data. So I've got a very simple SQL statement or a couple of SQL statements here that will create a couple of data tables. It'll create a inventory database that we can use for the rest of our demo. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and capture this, copy and paste. So now if I do a show databases, there we go, we've got an inventory database. Um, and if we do a show tables, there we go. Uh, these are the data tables in our inventory. And if we do a select all uh, from customers, there we go. That's those are our, the uh, rows in our customers table in our MySQL database. Cool. So now that we've got some test data to work with. Um, what we're going to do now is deploy that the BZM connector um, so that we're able to start capturing any data changes, right? And then propagating those data changes. Uh, to our Kafka broker. So I've got a manifest file here for the BGM. Oh, there we go. Um, so the BGM makes, um, the, the BGM has a couple of images um, available on Docker Hub. So right here you can see I'm just pulling an image from Docker Hub for the BGM connector. Let's go ahead. And actually, you know what, before I go ahead and create the connector, let's take a look in Kafka and see what the topics we have, what are the topics we have in Kafka. So go ahead and
use the Kafka console consumer to list out the topics that we have. So fresh Kafka installation, right? There's, there's nothing there. Um, no topics yet that have been created. Um, so what I'm going to do now is go ahead and apply the manifest file to create Visium. And again, you should hopefully see that pod come up. There we go. The Visium is now running. And if we take a look at the logs, There we go. Um, look at the full logs here. You notice a couple of interesting things. Um, so, what Babesium would do when it first starts up is it will create a number of uh, Kafka topics uh, for to store metadata. So the offset as well as any storage that it needs. Um, and so, let's see if I can show you that in the logs here where that actually happens. Yep. So uh, if you look at the logs here, what it does is it creates these topics uh, against that Kafka broker that I currently have it pointing to. And so now if you take a look at Kafka and we list out the Kafka topics, you'll see that those topics have been created. The, connect, uh, the config topic, the offsets topic, and the statuses topic. Great, so we have the Bezium running. Uh, what, what we need to do now is bootstrap it um, with a connector. Um, so come back over here to where I have Postman, and actually what I'll do is minimize my terminal window so you can see the logs running side by side here. So those are the Debezium logs on the right-hand side of the screen. The way you bootstrap the, um, a connector for Debezium is through an API that gets exposed. So if we currently um, just want to get against the root um, the URL, you would just get the version that we're running for the Debezium connector. Um, we can also get the number of connectors that we currently have registered for the BZM, and we don't have anything right now because we only just deployed the BZM, right? Uh, what we want to do here is go ahead and uh, create a connector. We'll call it inventory connector um, of type MySQL. So it's a MySQL database. So we want to use a MySQL connector. Um, and we've got a couple of configurations here for um, being able to access the MySQL database. Uh, for simplicity purposes for this demo, we're just using the root user. Of course, in production, you would have a separate service account that you would give um, the requisite permissions for to be able to um, access the database. Uh, um, and we are also telling it to uh, listen for uh, listen against the inventory database, which we had just created for any database changes. Um, so. Uh, what we're going to do here is now execute this post request with that JSON body. And you can see the logs are running on the right hand side of the screen. And what just happened? Well, to summarize, uh, when you register that conductor, there are a couple of, there are a couple of steps that uh, the BZM will do. Um, so you can see here, I've just highlighted step zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so forth, so on, right? So if I go ahead and maximize my terminal window again so it's easier to see. So as it's going through these steps, um, yeah. it, it connects to the database and it, it finds all the available tables for that database, right? So it, it found, if you remember in our show, data tables, uh, query that we ran earlier. We had a couple of those data tables that we had created in MySQL. Um, the BZM will pick up on those tables. So the addresses, customers, uh, orders, products, GOM, 
products on hand, um, and it will start listening to them. Um, at the same time, at the same time, it will go ahead and create those associated Kafka topics per each data table. Um, so if you take a look over here in our Kafka um, window and list the topics for Kafka, you can see we've got now new topics that have been created. Um, again, like I said, by default, the BZM will create a Kafka topic per database table. So you can see we've got a one-to-one -one mapping of a Kafka topic here per database table. Right? So addresses, customers, UM, orders, so forth, so on. Uh, so now that we've got the BZM running and we've got MySQL running, let's go ahead and execute a change against the database. We'll go ahead and quit those logs and we'll exit back into MySQL. Okay. Um, right, so, we, oh, okay. So we've got those tables in our inventory database. Uh, what we'll go ahead and do is run a um, insert command. Um, let's see here. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and exit out of that and. What I'm going to do is run a Kafka consumer. We're here, so we can see those changes coming in in real time. Okay. So I'm just using the Kafka console consumer here on the left hand side of the window, listening against the inventory customers topic, right? Because what we're gonna do here now on the right-hand side is go ahead and execute an insert statement to uh, insert um, a new customer. So if we do a select all from, those are our current customers. We'll go ahead and insert into that a new row. And you can see in really quick, relatively real time, uh, the BZM has captured that change. So if we do another select statement, we've got a new customer here called Kenneth Anderson, and the BZM has given us that JSON uh, change event that I showed previously in my slide uh, for uh, what that change was. Right. Um, likewise, if we decide to do a delete command, for example, and if we did a delete from customers where last name equals equals Henderson. There we go. There is another change event that the BZM propagates over to Kafka. All right, so let me go ahead and end the demo there and stop my screen share. Okay, so in conclusion, right, so we talked a little bit about the advantages of microservices, um, but at the same time, uh, talked a little bit about the challenges with how we've currently ended up developing our applications. Most often than not, we're still constrained with using shared databases and how that has affected really the way we're able to uh, bring more agility and speed to um, our development processes, as well as how we're able to solution for new uh, business capabilities. Uh, we talked a little bit about the idea of uh, this paradigm shift for uh, domain-driven data ownership uh, across um, all of our services for each business domain. Um, and the way the solution for that uh, is through a centralized streaming platform like Kafka that provides this shared journal or this log uh, that is number one, scalable because it can be distributed in the case of Kafka, and also retentive and replayable for new services and brings um, the ability to be able to develop our services and data more autonomously. And finally, we looked at the BZM um, and how we're able to leverage this um, technology, this change data capture, uh, to be able to capture these any change events that happen 
across our distributed set of services and be able to propagate those changes um, to any other services that we need. Uh, so I'll go ahead and end there um, and take a look at if we have any questions. I don't see that we have any questions come in, but if anybody has any questions, please feel free to go ahead and start sending them in. How are we doing on time? Five minutes, I think. I think we have five more minutes. Okay, we got one question. Will slides be available? Yes, I will be making the slides available on SCED. Uh, as soon as this presentation ends. Uh, one other thing I forgot to note uh, is now that we're using, now, well, if you're to go ahead and go down this architectural route, right? Um, if you're using Change Data Capture and streaming your changes to a streaming platform like Kafka, uh, this also enables you to do a whole host of um, additional uh, opportunities uh, with using um, uh, what, what, what's the term um, stream processing, stable stream processing. Mind blank for a moment there. Um, and so I believe there was a session that was done yesterday uh, about learning how to do event stream processing with Pac-Man actually by Ricardo, last name Fer Ferreira. Um, it was actually in that talk, very interesting talk, um, and it provides a, a whole host of opportunities for how you can enrich your data um, with stateful stream processing. So if you want to learn more, I highly encourage you to um, listen to that recording later as well. Okay. Oh, I did. I did not scroll down to the questions. Okay, let's see here. Um, next question is, if a service is reading the changes from DB log from topics that are published by another service and is trying to update its own DB during such situation, how does the BZM guarantee that these do not get published to topics that can be, uh, I'm not, let me see if I can reread this question. If a service is reading the changes from database logs, from topics that are published by another service and is trying to update its own database, maybe such a database. Not quite sure I understand the scenario of this question. Um, I'm not quite sure. okay. So I think what the question is asking is uh, what happens in the event where you might have any cyclical dependencies or updates that happen against the database. Um, I don't think that should be an issue because the way the BZM works is it will capture changes from the transaction logs. Um, so in a ideal scenario, right, the BZM will capture these changes uh, at least once. Um, but in the event where the BZM fails, for example, and needs to restart itself, uh, it will either look to a snapshot that it initially first creates. Um, and in those situations, uh, you may run into issues where you get um, more than once updates that the BZM sends out, right? Um, and so in those kind of situations, I think it's important that um, you also uh, think about how your application handles uh, those changes. Um, and I would recommend um, engineering your applications in such a way where they handle them in an idempotent manner. Uh, so for example, using creates, uh, excuse me, using posts instead of puts, for example. So if there ever is an event where you get um, more than once updates for a particular row, uh, you don't want duplicate data that gets created, for example, right? So um, 
being able to manage those in an ad opponent manner um, is one way of handling those. Um, another question is for a high DB transaction volume service, what is the latency factor introduced by Debezium? So, okay, so I don't have exact numbers because I haven't been able to run um, a proper performance test uh, in uh, against Debezium, but um, what I've seen in the past is uh, the BZM is very quick at picking up changes, right, as you saw in the demo. Um, but like I was talking about before, when you first uh, bootstrap the BZM with the connector, it'll create that snapshot view um, of that initial database. So what that means is if you've got um, a database, maybe a legacy database that already has a lot of data in it, and you first register a connector um, against that database, it's going to take some time for Debezium to go through and snapshot all the data that's currently in that database. And that, in my experience, has been um, something to uh, be aware of uh, because uh, sometimes if you've got large amounts of data, um, you, that snapshot can take, take a while before it's finally up to date and caught up with the current uh, standing of the data. Okay. I think we're just about out of time. But if any of you guys have, or if any of y'all have any other additional questions, um, I will be on Slack. So please feel free to go ahead and hit me up there. Um, yeah, if, yeah, so I think that with that, I'll go ahead and conclude this uh, talk. Uh, again, uh, feel free to hit me up on Slack if you have any questions or just want to talk about any um, other uh, cloud DevOps processes in general. I'm more than happy to um, uh, talk with you guys on Slack. So thanks for joining, guys.